to the Fat Tail Investment Podcast. It's Callum Newman here. Um, I've got a, a, a thrill to have on uh, this week uh, a guy called Gary Norden. I've done a couple of interviews with him in the past, but not for, for this particular podcast. He wrote a fantastic book, which I'd encourage anyone interested in markets or, well, especially the stock market, to read. Uh, it's called An End to the Bull. And uh, previous to that, he also did one on technical analysis, and that's a critique of technical analysis, something you don't hear often. Gary has worked in the investment banks. Um, he's been his own trader, and now he's got a unique course up and running that's been sponsored by a major uh, exchange as well, so a very big endorsement. Uh, and I wanted to get him on to talk about uh, a style of trading that you've heard of called day trading. Now, usually most people, when that's mentioned, they do it in a derogatory way um, as a kind of sign that there's you know, lots of retail and dumb money in the market, that kind of thing. Well, actually, that's not true. And guys as smart as Gary can rip out a lot of alpha from the market uh, trading on a daily time frame. But it's not something you hear about very often. So I thought I'd get him on to talk about uh, his new course and whether it's right for you. And Gary is the type of guy who says, uh, it's not for everybody uh, and that he puts walls basically uh, in place deliberately to weed out uh, people who are uh, either not interested, don't have the time, don't have the money or don't are not up for the challenge. So a very interesting discussion about trading uh, on a day, daily time frame and in what's called the futures markets, which is uh, a different style of trading again. So here he is, Gary Norton, um, talking about Day trading. Public's out there throwing darts through board support. I don't throw darts through board. They're on sure things. Alrighty, earlier I alluded to the fact that I've got uh, Gary Norton joining me today. Uh, he's been a frequent guest with me in the last 12 months or so, um, but for my uh, service through Fattail Media, not for the Fattail uh, podcast before. So this is the the first time on the, the podcast. So, Gary, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. Now, we were just uh, talking before we uh, hit the record button earlier how we were talking last time about uh, trading and indicators and, and how they can lead people astray. Today, I wanted to bring you on to talk about the futures market. So you're a derivatives expert, and they fall into that bucket. Most people listening to this would be familiar with the concept of trading shares. You yep. buy a stock, hopefully you buy it, uh, uh, sell it for more, et cetera. Can you tell us about futures and why you see that as a preferable area, which I presume you do, than trading shares directly? Yeah, well, so futures, they obviously have a long history. Um, they're, you know, they're standardized contracts. They have central clearing systems. Um, and so, and they tend to be, you know, reasonably cheap to trade as well, you know, so um, they, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're good products in that way. Um, they, what I would say is that they're, they're better products usually for day traders. So if you're an investor and you're looking to build a portfolio and you want to invest for the long term, then obviously shares, shares are where you're going to go. Um, but the thing with futures, they because there's an element of, of leverage involved with them because of the structure of the market and the way the products themselves are structured, um, they offer a, a really good way for day traders to uh, access markets and to be able to use really what's you know quite a, a small amount of capital, but to, to work it hard because you can trade you know many times a day with futures markets. So um, that is, I suppose, the, the angle that I come from with futures markets. Now, there's obviously an angle of hedging. You know, they can be used for hedging purposes by portfolio, by you know, investors for their portfolio. They can use futures to hedge portfolios. They can obviously, you know, agricultural and you know, and um, uh, other commodities can be used as hedging instruments for for the industry and for farmers and for oil producers and so forth. So they have a number of of uses. Um, but I say for the angle that I generally come from is as a day trading instrument. Um, so, they're a really good day trading instrument. Just for those listening to jump in, like commodity futures sort of began that sector, if you like, and then stock futures came along. Uh, now we've got Bitcoin futures. Um, yeah. <laughs> which one do you jump between those sort of different ones or do you focus on one in particular? 
Yeah, for, for day traders, I tend to suggest, you know, becoming an expert in one, focusing on one. So, you know, I, I personally, when I day trade, I like, you know, equity indices, they can be quite um, volatile. So I'll concentrate on an index like the DAX, for example, which, you know, it moves quite a lot. It's got a good tick size. So you get well rewarded for trades and, and you get lots of trades. Um, I have, you know, clients and students who are trading, you know, NASDAQ futures, uh, ES, the E-mini S&P 500 futures, a very liquid contract. They move a lot and they offer, you know, good day trading opportunities. Um, but, you know, I suppose futures are in, in that way uh, would compete against CFD products and to some degree, you know, FX platform products. But there are significant advantages with futures as opposed to CFDs. So, um, you know, I, I would always strongly recommend people look at futures first and, you know, and, 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 and try and look at futures rather than those other products. It's funny you talk about day trading because if you're trading North America or Europe, you're obviously not there in the day. You're based in Western Australia. What what times are you actually trading? So uh, afternoons and, and evenings um, for for those markets. Um, yeah, the day here, and that generally is the case with not just with my day trading, but also with the the trades that, that we use in the fund and and whatever. You know, my day tends to be early morning, which is sort of end of the US session, and late in the evenings, which is you know the the start of the US session, and then the middle of the day here in WA yeah, is is pretty much left for me. Well, let's talk a little bit about day trading itself because. Generally, if you see day trading mentioned, it's usually done in a derog derogatory way. Yeah. I find from the financial press and they'll go, Absolutely. oh, you know, there's more day traders out. It's a sign that the market's, you know, getting too hot or, you know, the too many suckers are getting sucked in. Um, but in your book, and Enter the Bull, part of that, you talk about why you like day trading and why you think it's a very effective way to trade. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the strengths that you perceive and why perhaps uh, – there's this pushback against it. Yeah, so it's 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 a great um, question to talk about the fact that it has sort of got a bad press, and it has, and I think a lot of that depends on on where you come from. So if you think about you know where I come from as a day trader, um, you know my career in London uh, for investment banks as a market maker in a number of different products on the trading floor and the futures exchange as an options market maker, um, and generally as a market maker, you are day trading, you're in and out of trades very quickly. And so, of course, I, I learned that that's a, you know, potentially a, a good style of trading. But then, of course, the way I learned to trade was very different from the average retail trader. So by learning those skills, um, I learned how to um, get in and out of trades quickly and, and use the edge that market makers have. Um, I think that I understand why day trading has um, a poor reputation, and that's generally because a lot of the techniques that are taught to retail traders are basically really unreliable, poor techniques. Um, and day traders often get over leveraged. They're looking for the wrong type of day trades, um, and, and they generally get hurt. But I think like anything, if you have the right skill set, um, it can be a really interesting form of trading. And, you know, one thing I'll say is for um, is if you think about it um, in terms of, of risk, there's a sort of a generalized view that, you know, the short term is very noisy and the long term, it's a lot easier. But I'll counter that by saying, if I ask someone to, to tell me, OK, where do you think this contract, let's say gold? Where do you think it's going to be in six months' time? Give me a range. You know, where do you think it's going to be in 12 months' time? Give me a range, right? People are going to find that very difficult to come up with a range. Now, but then if I ask them, where do you think it's going to be in 30 seconds' time? It's a lot easier to come up with a range of where it will be in 30 seconds. So in that basis, to work out a risk reward and a trading strategy actually can be easier in the short term. I would say it's far easier to come up with a range for where gold will be in 30 seconds and trade gold futures than to say, well, where's gold going to be in 12 months? So whilst I think, you know, so for some products like equities, and if you're an investor, you can have a look at a company, you can see the trajectory, you can make them. And because companies sort of turn around more slowly, you know, and if they've got a good trajectory and good management, you can see that and work on that. So in an equity environment, yes. And, you know, we don't trade, you know, 
equity futures as such, you know, but indices themselves, well, they're different, right? Indices can go up and down 1% a day, and there's different on the sentiment of that day. And what I say is, it's easier to understand, right, today, the sentiment on this market is weak, I'm going to trade from the short side, today, the sentiment is strong, trade from the long side, and just, you know, do that every day. So I don't necessarily feel that day trading is harder than other methods. I just feel that retail traders have been taught the wrong methods. And that goes again to a lot of what retail traders are taught that, you know, this industry is about prediction, about picking lows and selling highs and that sort of stuff. And that's just not true. That's not what the pros are doing. And if you can structure a, a style of trading, which is more about just getting in and out for small amounts, just, just picking off a little bit of money here and a, a couple of ticks here on a trade and just do that, you know, a number of times, um, the power of frequency uh, is is very important and 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 very strong in, in in trading. You know, people just misunderstand frequency, and what they look for is to capture the big moves. As a day trader, that's the wrong way to approach it. You know, it's just not not the way to approach it. You don't get enough opportunities. If you miss that move or you get it wrong, that might be it for the day. But if you're focusing on just small amounts, there are lots of those in a day, and so that's that's what we should be looking at, and that's how. Really, all the professional operators in the short-term trading space operate. When you talk about um, day trading and futures, do you feel that someone begins with stocks? Usually, it doesn't say they have to do like this, but they begin with stocks. Then they start to go, well, I want to sort of ramp up my, go to the next level, if you like. And that's where they, they, they go to futures. Is that generally how people, in your experience, find their way to the futures market? I think it could be a yeah. I think it could be one way. I think people that have got an investment portfolio and like that, you know, aspect and think, you know, what I want to do this, but a bit more, you know, because obviously when you're building an investment portfolio, you're not making a lot of decisions every week. You know, you may not have to make any decisions. But people that perhaps enjoy the challenge, and that's one of the things. It's a challenge. It's not easy. It's a challenge. If people enjoy the challenge, they might think, yeah, I, I want to sort of try and take this challenge up, but do it daily. Um, so they could move that way. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people get enticed into day trading by the sort of adverts that you see on some of those YouTube, you know, when we're flashing through YouTube and it's like, you know, oh, yeah, I've got a dead cert way of making money. And But they're usually pointing people towards FX markets and CFD products. Um, so there's a lot of that that goes on. And, and obviously, you know, we don't I don't think people should be enticed for that reason. It is a challenge and it's hard work. Um, but I think if people like a challenge, and in, uh, interested in markets and are thinking, you know, I would like the opportunities to try and develop the skills to create a sort of more daily PL, whereas your portfolio is more, you know, you've managed it and you think, yeah, over the next three months or six months, this portfolio will do well. But if you're interested in more of a daily PL, um, then, you know, you could go more towards day trading. Um, and they can sit side by side, you know, you can have an investment portfolio, you know, and day trade and then the two things don't necessarily mix. Um, it's interesting you just mentioned gold there too, because, and sort of, you know, trying to get the big move in that, because when we spoke last time, uh, we talked, touched a little bit about gold then too. And basically the gold price has just kept going sideways. So if yeah. you'd taken a big position in gold or gold stocks it, and sort of held on for six months, it's really done nothing for you. But when you get looking at the, the chart as it is there, that sort of sideways choppy thing, yep. it, it, I've never day traded gold like that, but is there lots of opportunity just, as you say, getting up every day going, well, I think it's going down today and yep. short, oh, it's going to go long, that sort of thing. So you can yep. sort of rip alpha out of a sideways market. If it's well. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, and that, that's that's part of it to understand is, you know, there's actually a lot more opportunities on that daily basis than over the term. And if you look at, you know, there are lots of people that make these predictions on gold. I mean, we all see them, right? We all get fed adverts about them and why gold's going to go to the moon or whatever. And, is, you know, inflation's going to peak strong and that's great for gold. Well, inflation is strong and gold's going sideways. So yeah. there's all that sort of side of things, right? And, and as you say, in between that, realistically, you know, gold has, you know, a very good relationship with real yields. So if you just come in every day, you're having a look at what the sentiment in real yields are on that day, and you trade gold on that day, then yeah, you can pick up, you know, today I'm short gold and, you know, make money. At the end of the day, the thing about day trading is you're flat. So that's the other thing is that when when you finish your trading, whatever p &L you have, that's it, you're done and you finish. And then the, the mindset is you come in the next day and it's a completely different day. 
you start all over again. What's the sentiment today? You do it again. So just exactly as you say, um, while these people are trying to capture big moves, you're just saying, as long as it moves every day, I don't care where it goes. And yesterday you were trading from the short side, generally today, maybe from the long side and tomorrow different. Um, so I think in that way, if you embrace that kind of challenge, it can be quite liberating to, to sit there and think, I don't have to predict where gold is going every day. I just come in today and I just trade what's there in front of me. Um, I, I think that, you know, that's obviously as a market maker in investment banks and, and so forth, that's how I got involved in this industry. And, and I, I, I kind of love that aspect. You know, I, with my fund, we have position trades. It's a completely different game. But I love the aspect of I don't have to predict where this thing's going. I just come in today, have a look what the sentiment is, and then use my market making style skills to try and just get in and out of that. Having said that, so then are you watching the first 20 minutes of trade of the gold contract before you make a move? Yeah, I mean, you have to gauge it somehow or you already go in with an inclination that you're going to go short and then you wait for some sort of signal or how does it work? So you you would do your um, your pre market prep. So you know before you, you you start trading, you're having a look at what the environment is. So you're generally looking at correlations and other in, things in that market. So for gold, for example, we know that real yields is a a really good um, correlation for gold. You know U.S. dollar to some degree as well. It's not always so strong though. Um, so you'd look at those correlations. What are they doing? You know, and let's say real yields are going higher and the US dollar was going higher on that particular day as you're coming into trading, you would be more inclined to be looking at the short side of, of, of gold, right? Both of those things would be generally a little bit negative for gold. And then basically, uh, as a day trader, I am looking not necessarily for uh, levels or anything like that. I don't use levels or anything like that. What I'm more looking for is opportunities where there's liquidity and pace of market. So there's a bit of action going on here. And there's some two-way action, which means I can get in and out of a trade quickly. You know, I look to get in and out of trades within a few seconds. Um, so literally just, okay, there's some two-way business here. I can get in, try and trade it from probably from the short side, not always uh, on that occasion, and just make a couple of ticks, you know, which is, which is not much. You know, we're talking about, you know, 20 cent, 30 cent moves in the price of gold, you know, and, and gold, for example, it's, it's $10 for one contract per tick. So if you can pull off, a couple of cents move, um, it's like 20 bucks, you know, but that might be two, three, four, five seconds. And what you're trying to do is find a number of those. Can I find 20 of those, 30 of those? You know, how many can I find of those sorts of trades? And obviously in that regard, you know, and obviously if a trade goes like a tick against you, you know, 10 bucks against you, you'll get out. So in that regard, it, you know, it's generally a far lower um risk kind of trading. That, that's the type of day trading that I do. Now, a lot of retail traders, unfortunately, get sent towards a style of day trading, which, you know, whether it's swing trading or another version of that, trying to find the low and trying to sell the high and try to make like a, a much bigger amount, 30, 40 ticks. That's far more difficult. That becomes a game of prediction. Often just, uh, it's, it's a game where they'll have, you know, if it goes wrong, it's good, you know, the p is gonna be quite big to the downside. If you have three or four days of those sorts of bad days, you're starting to, you know, really hurt your account. Whereas- and Just in terms of leverage, like what's a gold contract, a hundred grand? Um, gold futures actually, um, so as I said, the tick size for it, for every tick, this is what you want, is, is just $10 a tick. But I'm just trying uh, to think, like, by keeping it so short, you kind of neutralize that, the stress of the leverage, right, that's inherent in the contract. Yes, absolutely. But the thing is that the, the losses can still add up. So if you end up with a 30, 40 tick loss, you're still going to end up, even on one contract, you can, uh, can end up with a losses of, you know, a couple of grand, or and this is what the trouble is, as a day trader, you don't want P&Ls really on a one trade of that amount. But that's where a lot of retail traders get into is that they think that um, they need to have a P&L of $1,000, $2,000. The problem is that you have two or three bad trades and suddenly you're really under pressure. Whereas, you know, the, the style that, that I use is well, I'm only looking for 20 bucks, you know, and, and you know, that sort of P&L the, the, the point is frequency. How many moves of 20 bucks are there with two ticks in gold? There are thousands of them in a day. So I don't, you know, I only need to get 20, 30 of them and, and I pick up a reasonable amount and I'm not, you know, and what I'm doing is, so for example, the margin requirement to trade one gold contract, say I don't, I don't trade gold, but the margin requirement for it 
for brokers, maybe in the region of a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, depending on which broker you use. But it's something that's reasonably low. So if you think about it that way, what the, the, what the method that I'm suggesting and, and the way of trading is you trade that one contract, but you just trade that a lot, you know, 20, 30, 40 times. Uh, I think that's far um, a far stronger way to trade for retail traders than to trade that one contract with their $3,000 margin, for example, and to try and look at a P&L of $1,000 on the trade. And it's that when they start to look for the big moves that they get into trouble. And that's where the the high failure rate of retail traders. And also, of course, they're mostly using technical analysis and charts, which is very unreliable. Um, so you bundle that together, and that's why day trading ends up with a bad reputation because people are trading it in the wrong way. Um, and you know, it, it's because of the leverage and the tick size and the fact that you only need a, you know, a small amount of margin. It's kind of like driving a, a much faster car than, than investing, for example. Um, it's more powerful. And what I'm saying is that if you try to trade it in the same way and look for big moves, you're just going to get hurt. It's in these sorts of products, look for this very small term, look for small amounts, but frequency is the important thing. And just um, like when you're doing that, do you have a, a, a time where you just go, I'm done for the day, I'm spent, like I can't steer at the yeah. screen? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's pretty intense. And that's one thing that, that people have to realize in your day training. Uh, if you're doing it properly, that is. If you're using these charts and just trying to pick levels, you can kind of sit back and you wait for this thing to unfold over a couple of hours. But the professional approach, which is a lot more intense, a lot more focused. Um, so sure, I mean, I think, you know, the more you do it, the more you sort of build your stamina for it. But, you know, I, I know people that after sort of 30 minutes or an hour, you know, it's like very intense. So they need to have a bit of a break, you know. Um, it's certainly, I think for, for most people doing it for, four, five, six hours a day would be probably too much, frankly. Um, from my perspective, you know, I spent my whole life as a trader. So I used to get into, into work at like five or six in the morning and, and be in a bank until seven at night. And, and I could do hundreds of trades a day. So, you know, that's just, you know, that's something, you know, but it's a bit like, for example, you, sometimes there are some golf competitions where, you know, the, the pros will go out in the morning and they'll, you know, they'll go out in the afternoon to ride a cup, for example, they might play two rounds in a day. Now, I struggle with concentration past nine holes on a golf course, right? But as a pro, they, they, they're just much better at managing their concentration, their focus. And my focus when I play my nine holes is nowhere near the focus that they have. But that's the difference between being a pro and being, being me on the golf course. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's more intense. Uh, I see it and I say to people, it's, you know, if you're driven by challenges, and, and you want to develop good skills because it, it does require a good skill set to do it, then it's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, you might say, you know, kind of like doing a cryptic crossword or something like that. If people want a challenge. Um, that's what, what you know, trading is. But investing is a challenge too, you know, trying to find value in stocks or whatever as well. That's what Absolutely. we should be driven by. So when, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your course? Because this the course that you have created, which... Uh, wasn't around the last time I spoke to you. Yep. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're building there? Yeah. So I've, you know, used and had and and, and taught market making skills in banks and to professional traders for for decades. So every bank I worked at, I taught market making skills. And on the floor, I was an options trader. When the floor transitioned back to you know to screens i did i transitioned to become a futures trader and started to develop my market making skills for futures over the years i didn't really teach many people that like retail traders and and you know generally if um in terms of teaching people to trade it was investment banks and professional traders about a year or so ago you know some people came to me and i was talking to some ex-floor traders and there was kind of like a view you know, these skills are being lost, market making skills. There's fewer and fewer banks who make markets anymore. Um, it's all done on computers. So, you know, two client business essentially is just matched up or even within investment banks. So market making skills are being lost and they're not being lost because they're bad. They're being lost because everybody's just going, well, if I can cut out the trader and just get it matched, then it's cheaper. And so people said to me, you know, it's a shame to see them lost the skills. So, we started to develop a website, um, which is now live. And essentially, it's teaching a style of futures trading 
um, very short term, like I said, holding trades for a few seconds in a market making style. So with the course, I try to teach people, I don't need to teach them to become a market maker, but I need to teach them to think like a market maker. Where is their edge in markets, you know, and where is their not edge? Um, and, you know, and just to teach some rules and some processes as well. Um, that's a key part of what I try to teach some processes. So when you have a trade and it loses money, there's a process go through what, what could have gone wrong, fix it. Um, a bit like if you're on the golf course and you know, you hook a tee shot, you hook a tee shot, you don't just blindly get up and just hope that the next one goes straight. You know, a professional will sit there and think, okay, what could have caused me to hook a tee shot, go through the three or four things, make the adjustments and continue. That's the way a professional would work in a trading environment. So, um, not really, I suppose, you know, for new business necessarily, but um, I've created it. And what I've tried to try to do is to create the same sort of learning pathway that I had and other professionals had on the floor. So, start off with doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, what your background is. Um, everybody has to take what we call the yellow jacket course, which was the first exams you had to take on the floor before you can even buy any of my courses or even see what they're about. We want to make sure that people understand what futures markets are because there are a lot of people, you know, just see an advert and say, I'm going to trade futures and they don't really have the background. So we have a, a free course, but also an exam at the end of it that makes sure that no one can progress unless they have passed that exam. So the first thing is that's what we had to do on the floor. I'd had three years of experience market making in a bank when I went down to the floor. I started off as a nothing. I started off as a yellow jacket and I had to take exams in order to get into the pit. <clears throat> it wasn't, oh, well, Gary, you're already trading. You know how to trade. You've already made markets for an investment bank. You know how to make markets. You can go in a pit. I had to prove it. So we do the same thing. Make sure that people understand what futures are. So we have an exam to do that. And then, you know, we lay out the course. And um, again, there are tests and exams. This is what I had to do. Test people as they go along, which I also think is a good learning tool to see people can judge how they're going. So it's really trying to lay out that pathway, that same education pathway that I had um, and to, to, yeah, to, to leave that out there so that the skills don't get lost and so that, you know, traders have an, um, something different, they're unique skills. There's no one else that teaches in this way um, because most of the people teaching retail traders, day traders, um, frankly, have got no real proper professional experience there, you know, and so they're teaching sort of other methods, usually some sort of technical analysis. And in terms of the feedback you're getting, obviously you've had your first group go through. Um, yep. What's the response been like? Yeah, I've been really, really happy and impressed with the feedback. So generally the people that come to me have got reasonable experience of futures trading. Most of them it's, you know, we've surveyed them. It's over three years of futures trading experience. Pretty much all of them have taken other futures courses. And almost everybody that comes to me pretty much has taken other courses. And, and to see, you know, their uh, interest and excitement and also learning the way that they're going about it and the feedback has been really, really good. And we have also a subscription area where essentially um, people can um, send in videos of their trading and I'll narrate them and I'll go through them and I'll explain what's good, what's bad. And, and I post them all up in there so everybody can see what other traders are doing. But not just like, you know, futures markets, uh, they have, there's lots of forums on the internet for futures traders. And it's just people saying, oh, I do this and I do that. And they hide behind fake names and you never really know what they're doing. Right. But so here we have this unique environment where traders are setting their video. So we see exactly what they're doing. It's not like, oh, I do this and it, it, they're actually doing something else. But also the videos are narrated by me who designed the course. So I can explain this trade is not good, but this is why it's not good. And this is how you need to correct this type of strategy um, and this type of trade. So in that sense, everybody gets to learn from everybody else, which I think is really strong because one of the problems about trading from home is you only get to see your own mistakes. So you can only learn from your own mistakes. And, I, and one of the things I was fortunate with trading in investment banks and particularly on the floor alongside you know the thousands of traders is I get to see the mistakes of hundreds of traders. So I don't just get to see mine. That's a great learning environment. Yeah, I was going to say, um, there's a good book I quite like. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called One Good Trade. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, Mike Bellafore, I think his name is. 
Anyway, he, he describes that sort of thing, which is basically what you're replicating. He's like the head trader of his own firm. And he brings in the junior guys and then he sort of gives them feedback on what they're doing and, and they're, they're all learning off each other. And you're right, you can't replicate that by yourself. Um, so when you're looking at the footage, though, is it like a camera behind them and it's on the screen or what's... Is that no, they the just thing? do a screen, screen recording. Oh, screen recording, right. So, yes. Yeah, they'll screen record it and then I'll, I'll go through it. And it's interesting because even I'm learning things because there are mistakes that I'm seeing that I didn't even know existed. So that's really cool. So people are making, and, and, and it's interesting. And, I, and then every month we have a meetup where I'll talk about things that are, 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 are coming around or stuff. And I'll bring up some of these things that I see in the videos because I'm seeing new biases in the way they trade or new mistakes. So that would also help me improve the course because I didn't realize, obviously I've only known myself and the professionals, I've only worked in the professional industry before. So I'm seeing retail traders now in reasonable numbers and now realizing, oh, okay, so people can do that. That's an interesting mistake. And so now it's up to me to you know include some of that. If I see enough times, include that in the course to, to say to people, look, be careful of this. It's quite interesting. When you're talking about such short time frames, though, I mean, how many mistakes can you make? Surely, Lots. <laughs> Lots. No, seriously, it's interesting because one of the things is, so people often think, you know, all you can do as a trader is you buy, you sell. And if you buy and the trade loses money, you are either bought at the wrong price or you shouldn't have been buying or whatever. But actually, there's, particularly with day trading, there's a number of things that can go wrong with a trade. And this is one of the things that I try and do because most traders come in and they don't know that, right? And most people that educate them don't know that either. And I break a trade down into like six, seven parts. And that's why I say, if a trade goes wrong, you need to go through this checklist, which one of these six, there's a number of things that could, could have been wrong. What I'm actually finding though, is that the retail, the traders that I'm teaching have found another few areas that could go wrong. Is it, is it is, stuff like, you should not have a beer in your hand when you're trading. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that, sadly, because it's only a screenshot, but that, that, that's something that I could possibly ask as well. But trades can actually be broken down in very minute ways. This is the precision. And it's a bit like, I think that most retail traders, with the people that are teaching them, it will be a bit like learning to play golf, where the guy says, well, what do you do? Well, you swing a golf club, right? And then if you miss it, you swing it again. That's essentially how they're trading. Whereas what I'm saying, which is a more complex, I break that down. Imagine a golf swing. Well, you need to grip it in this way. You need to have your stance this way, your shoulders this way. On the back swing, the takeaway needs to be here. As the club hits the ball, it needs to be square. Think about all those little things. And that's what I try to do with trading is break a trade down into a number of very small parts. And this is why it takes months for people to sort of master this to get it. Um, but by breaking it down, you can then see all the little parts. Okay, this is the one that went wrong on that trade. Um, so I need to work on that and improve that. And with the, the videos, what's quite cool is the site's been up now for three months is we're also starting to watch people. So people, those videos for three or four months ago. And, you know, I, I'm always very frank with people. I think you have to be absolutely brutally frank. You know, that's part of being a head trader is, you know, if someone's done something that's crap, you call it. So, you know, we've got a couple of traders there who their first videos, I'm absolutely, you know, tearing apart. You know, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And then you see that like a month later, they've sent me another video and it's a bit better. And then for one of them, like we were on to like his fourth and now into December. And the last one I posted last week, there's some exceptional training in there. And it's fantastic to see. This is take this is an actually for him over about three or four months. Um, and it's fantastic to see that as they respond to that feedback, that you can see the gradual improvement. It's never going to be like, that's it, I've made it. And it's always going to be continually hard work. But now we can see in in the exchange, which is what I call the um the subscription area, people can see other traders' journeys. And as I say, they can actually see it for real, not someone just saying, oh, yeah, you know, I made it, I'm great, you know. Um, they can actually see the trades that that person did. They can see how I try to correct him and how I try to narrate him. And, and hopefully people are, you know, reflecting on that as well. And um, it's been really, really cool to, to watch that. And do you want to, you've got the red jacket in the background there. Do you want to just talk about yeah. what is it? You said you've posted a few out. Like, what have those yeah. guys done to deserve the red jacket? Tell us what it is first. But so, so red jackets on the floor. 
um, you know, everybody knows that floor traders wore colorful jackets, but most traders on the floor were actually working for banks and actually weren't what, what I would call a trader. They were actually um, essentially brokers. They were filling orders. You know, that's what the vast majority of people in the pits were f executing orders on behalf of clients or traders. The only people that traded with their own money that took risk were what were called locals. They traded, put their own money, and they wore red jackets. So they were quite special. And it was quite a coveted thing to be a local. It showed that you put up, put up your own money and that you were trading with your own money. So only those people were actually what we would classify as risk-taking traders. So what I say is that, you know, people, when they trade from home for themselves, are effectively like locals. You're putting up your own money and you're trading that way. So I try to teach the skills that locals had and to tell people, think of yourself like that, not like a, a retail trader sitting at home gambling against the big, you know, the, the big guys or whatever. Think of yourself like a professional, like a local. So with the, the Red Jacket course, which is the sort of the full course, which has lots of videos and that in it, there's an exam at the end. And it's no, not a short exam. It probably takes about an hour, an hour and a quarter. And if people who have gone through the course pass that exam first time, and only first time, um, then I, I will send them a, a red jacket. So these red jackets are made in Chicago. There's only one manufacturer left uh, who makes, these are the original red jackets that locals wore in Chicago and London. They're the same um, style that I have. And, and, and I just put, you know, I have my logo put on the, on the back, the Northern Method logo. Uh, and we send them out to people. And it's interesting as well that the amount of time that people are taking over that red jacket course and, you know, and the time before they take the exam, they really want to get one of these jackets. They really want to pass it. So it's had that other effect, which I really love of people spending more time learning. You know, they really want it. So they're going to learn it. And because if you, you know, if you fail it first time and you want to take it second time, that's fine. But what I say to them, if you want the jacket, then you've got to buy it yourself. You know, there's a bit of pressure because trading is under pressure. So the pressure is there's a time limit for the exam and only first time passing do you get the jacket. And it's a you know, 80% 80, 80 pass mark. It's not like we set the pass at 60%. It's 80% pass. Well, with the course, is it like a three-month thing? or How does it start? No, so the course just sits there. So people can go back to it whenever they want. They can spend as much time on it as they want. They can take the exam whenever they want. Um, they, but the only thing is they have to have... So we, we have it so that people can't skip a section. They have to go through every section. And what I find is that, for example, the Red Jacket course, people are spending in terms of hours, 50, 60 hours. You know, so that's a fair amount of time um, and before they take the exam on, on studying it. And then usually you'll, you'll keep coming back to it just to reinforce certain ideas. And then you can go into, people can go into the exchange where we have all these videos and every month we add another three or four videos. There's now hours of videos that you can watch of other traders and, you know, and then I, you know, I narrate all of the videos. Let's go through this trade. Let's stop it. Let's have a look at what's gone wrong here and or what's gone right. And but is there sort of a thing where they send you the, what they perceive to be their good ones or they send you the ones that are what they thought was terrible or. Yeah. So some know, people or? send me particularly like this, can you have a look at this trade? And some people will just send me a link to a half hour video. And I, usually I won't go through the whole half hour, but I might pick six or 10 minutes of it. By the time I've broken that down and sliced and diced it, it's probably like 30 minutes, you know, where we post it on, on the site. But you know, it might be like six, seven, eight trades in that time or more. Um, and, you know, I can go through each one. And there's some inter really interesting stuff. Like I say, like I've been seeing mistakes that I've never knew existed before. So that also helps me to train people. But also like someone said to me, like, here's a trade which I, you know, in his opinion, it ticked every box. It was a great trade and yet he lost money on it. And it was a really interesting trade because there were some really good aspects to it, but there were some hidden poor aspects to it. And so, you know, I was able to, you know, go through that. And again, so we get to see things that as I say, on our own, we may not have normally seen, but you get to see it because we're all learning from, from lots more people. And when you critique them, are you critiquing literally what you're seeing or you're like, no, that was a gold trade and I know that interest rates in the US dollar did this at that time. And no, no, that's it's right. Literally, no, the literally just that trade, yeah. A, a lot of times I'm not trading the markets they're doing. I'm just looking at that trade. So with what I said, like, because I have this breakdown of all the individual parts, again, like a golf instructor can say to you when he sees your swing, uh, now that one was hooked, 
because your shoulders were, were not aligned properly. Whereas someone who's not a golf instructor, like, you know, like we're all, when we're learning to play golf, we play with our mates and, you know, you hit a bad shot and, and they usually say, oh yeah, 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 head was up. Right. Or they'll say some sort of a good golf instructor will be able to pick apart your swing and tell you exactly why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I think a lot of people in the retail environment, you know, just don't do that. They will just come up with perhaps, oh, you know, just a generic or general kind of idea. But there are specific rules. And by breaking it down like a golf instructor, yeah, on this occasion, this was the fault in this trade. You know, and I can pick apart those trades and, and every trade. And if this was a good one, we can have a look through it. Does it tick all the checklist? Did he do this? You know, is it, in golf parlance, was his grip right? Yes. Was his stance right? Yes. Was his takeaway good? Yes. Did the club come down? Yes. This is a good trade. And you can show it. Whereas another trade, it might be, yeah, his grip's good. His stance good. The takeaway was good, but the club didn't come down right. And therefore he didn't end up with the right trade. It's that kind of environment. Um, so that's why there's lots of little things and why it takes several months to build that together. Like it would take several months to build a golf swing, right? You get taught things and then, you know, you go away onto the practice range and you're practice for months with a golf swing to groove it, to get it right. It's the same thing. And hopefully also by doing it this way and teaching people what all of these mechanics are of a, of a, of a trade, people will be able to correct themselves. That's what I'm hoping is that over time, they learn to correct themselves. They go, oh, yeah, go, just go through the checklist, blah, blah, blah. This was what was wrong with that trade. And so when they have a loss, they can correct themselves and move on now and improve for the next trade. And just in terms of your guys, like you said that most of them have been training for three years. I presume that most of them have other jobs or, they, or they're, yeah. they're pure full-time trades. No, most people would have jobs. And I would always say to people, you know, until you've reached a level of consistency that is very strong, you should never leave your job to become a day trader. So most people are trading, you know, outside of their jobs. You know, I've been fortunate that, you know, a few people that I have taught, um, you know, over the years, and I haven't taught many retail traders, but a few of them have gone on to become, you know, um, full-time traders. And some of them have even gone on to become professional traders, such as hedge fund traders and that. But, you know, often those people have come to me because they want that. So, you know, I've, this is much um, more in-depth level of instruction, but most people know it's just, you know, they would want to try and um, uh, perhaps you would say second income, but I'm loath to say that because, you know, it's only becomes a second income if you're good at it. And I'm not saying that everybody that takes my course is going to be good at it. Just like my golf pro can't say everybody he teaches is going to become a great golfer, you know, but all I do is and I don't try and entice people into this either. I'm not saying, oh yeah, this is a great way of having a second income. This is a great, you know, it's hard work. If people decide that for themselves that, yeah, I want this challenge of day trading, then I just say, well, I'll help people as much as I can. But I don't, in, and that's always something, and you'll know that's from my book. I say that in the book, if the one thing you get out of this is to understand this is a difficult business and you decide you don't want to become a day trader, I'm pretty cool with that. I'm really happy because for many people, deciding not to become a day trader is the right decision and a very good, and I'm, I'm really happy that people make that decision as well. And by having like the exam at the beginning, people said to me, well, people are going to get put off. They don't want to take a test just to be able to buy your course, I said, well, if that's what someone's view is, then they shouldn't become a day trader. I had to take exams to become a trader. So if you're someone that says, oh, I'm not going to be bothered to read through that course and take that exam just to figure out, you know, just to be able to purchase Gary's course, that's a mindset that probably should, means you should be excluded anyway from this business. So I'm trying to put those gates in place to make people think really hard before they decide to buy the course. Yeah, you like, do you really want to do this? Yeah. yeah. And you get yeah. rid of the time wasters and the enough nuffs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I do get the sense from your book and some of your articles and stuff. You are, your crowd, I think, is going to be people who are interested in like self improvement and pushing their limits and, and, you know, taking it to a professional level and not just. Yeah you know, rocking up and having a bit of a lash and yeah, uh, all that sort of stuff. Well, yeah. it sounds really curious. I'd love to see some of these videos, actually. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see what your feedback is. But um, do you think just to, to bring it back, because between your book and your course, you do mention day trading for shares in the book. Is what you teach in the futures course applicable to the share market? 
So technically, the the skills of market making are certainly applicable to, to share trading. So, and, and I, it's a good question. I get asked it quite a fair bit because a lot of people are more comfortable with shares. So in theory, it is possible. In reality, the difficulties can be the... Brokerage? Sorry? Brokerage, I going to think. Yeah, it could be brokerage. It just can be the... So with the futures, for example, if I put you know, $3,000 of margin, okay, and one trade in gold, which, you know, a two tick move, which is 20 cent move is 20 bucks, right? And I can get dozens of those. If you think about in the stock market, the average bid and offer spread, and let's say you hold a trade for a few seconds, you're going to make maybe two or three cents. You've got to trade that in really quite reasonable size, but we're not allowed to trade reasonable size for this method because you need to be in and out quickly. So if you think about well, how much can I make of three cents on 3,000 shares or something like that? You know, it's going to be small and brokerage eats it up. Um, in some markets, for example, in the US equity markets, um, a lot of the order flow, um, which is actually quite key for us to trade against. So the order flow gets routed through um, market makers. And a key point about futures markets and about my style is we're actually trying to target other retail traders because we realize that they're probably the weakest traders in the market. So uh, my style is aimed at trying to analyze and work out all the weaknesses of the other retail traders and pick them off. I work out when they make mistakes. It's harder to go short with the equities. It's harder to go short with equities as well. Um, and like I say, within with a lot of stock markets, you can't actually trade directly against those retail traders. Um, you know, so it, it is more difficult. If you're, if you're trading, uh, you know, um, a stock that is quite volatile, that gives you good moves. It, you know, it can move 20, 30, 50 cents at a time, but also they're probably going to have wider spreads. They're going to be more um, difficult. Um, so some of those sort of smaller cap stocks. Um, and if, you, you know, you need very good skill. So, you know, when I was in banks, yeah, I, I've, tr I've traded this style in equities. Um, but saying that, you know, I think you need, to trade in reasonable size uh and it, so it's not ideal for those markets all right and uh, just to finish how far away is your options course that's the one that i'm keen to do yeah so the options course um is probably going to be early next year uh we're just working on some novel ways of uh, some novel ideas for that um i've taught again options for decades in banks so i and i what i want to do is have uh, it's increased that. So generally in the past, I've, I've taught options, options strategies. I want to increase that course. So I'm writing more content now to include, like we had the discussion last time, the volatility products, VIX and VXX, because a lot of misunderstanding of those products. So um, I, I hope early next year, um, the options course will be ready as well. Um, and that will apply, you know, I'm not going to necessarily focus on options on futures or options on stock. It's going to be options, you know, generally, again, there'll, there'll be quizzes and, and, and that kind of thing. And the idea, again, is to put as much information and in a professional style. So it's not going to teach people um, like, oh, yeah, you, you sell options. That's it. You know, and you look for this setup. It's going to be teaching people as much about options as possible. And for example, what are the pitfalls of selling options? Because I don't like selling options, right? So what are the pitfalls? What are the problems with it? Covered calls. A lot of investors are interested in, in covered calls, buy right strategies. So explain, this is a, you know, that will be a section in as well. This is the benefits. There are a lot of downsides to covered calls and a lot of downsides that people don't understand. So it's going to explain sort of the whole gamut of options from beginning right up to a reasonable standard. And the idea is with, with the way I teach options is not this is a style and you always look for this setup. It's you understand as many different aspects of options as possible. And then your job with options is to try and find the right trade for the current market conditions. So right, right now, volatility is high and you know there's only a week to go to expiry for the options I want. This is the trade I need. You know, and then a week later, it's, well, volatility is low and I'm looking for three months to expiry. So this is the trade I need. That's how we should trade options. And that's what I want to explain to people, how you select the right that's trade for the right time. Uh, and just as an example of that, I wrote to you a while ago and said, look, I've got this trade idea. I'm sure there's an options trade here, but I just... I can't. I don't know the the best way to go about it in terms of the timing and all that sort of stuff. So that's why I, I saw the yes. opportunity, and and thus far, 
it would have theoretically worked. The share that I was interested in has gone up, but it's like I didn't know which option to get and all that sort of stuff. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Great. So thank you for coming on. I'll just emphasize if you're listening, um, if you're interested in equities and just beginning sort of, not beginning, is like looking for background help with starting out in stock markets and in markets, grab the book and enter the bull. And obviously, if the idea of futures is interesting, you would go on, uh, is it GaryNorton.com? Uh, Norton Method. Norton Method, sorry. Uh, and check out what's available there. So thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure. And My as pleasure. soon as that options course is, uh, is ready, we'll get you back to talk about options and what's maybe we'll talk a little bit about the current state of markets once Christmas and all that stuff has, has, has gone through. Sounds like a plan. Thanks a lot for having me, Callum, and Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everybody. And um, wish you all well and look forward to, to being back on. Thanks a lot.